see in my mind a noble and puissant nation, rousing herself like a strong man after sleep and shaking her invincible locks methinks i see her as an eagle mewing her mighty youth and kindling her undazzled eyes at the full midday beam purging and unscaling her long abused sight at the fountain itself of heavenly radiance while the whole noise of timorous and flocking birds with those also that love the twilight flutter about amazed at what she means and in their envious gabble would prognosticate a year of sects and schisms rembrandt also in his prime celebrated the god of his dutch republic turning the usual portrait row into a sect of one search for the dissevered body of truth what blind gabbling it too must have occasioned for all who lacked the trust which is Milton's axiom of freedom. Who knows not that truth is strong next to the Almighty? A faith hard to hold through the fury that greeted those pamphlets of free church, free state, free marriage. The cleansing of the temple had become a symbol for reform and counter-reform, thus with El Greco or with the 1626 Rembrandt. Compare the violence of Milton's sonnet. I did but prompt the age to quit their clogs by the known rules of ancient liberty, when straight a barbarous noise environs me of owls and cuckoos, asses, apes, and dogs, as when those hinds that were transformed to frogs railed at Latona's twin-born progeny, which after held the sun and moon in fee. But this is got by casting pearl to hogs that bawl for freedom in their senseless mood and still revolt when truth would set them free. License they mean when they cry liberty, for who loves that must first be wise and good. But from that mark how far they rove we see for all this waste of wealth and loss of blood. But if men are such brawling hogs as Bosch had painted them a century before Rembrandt, how is the temple to be cleansed? The peasant war had led Luther from Christian freedom to revolutionary reversal. Reason must be deluded, blinded, and destroyed. So Hobbes, Milton's older contemporary, by a Machiavellian materialism of motif and a logic of atomic reduction, proves that men cannot, like bees, find natural agreement, but must snatch at artificial covenant against greed, hatred, and the condition of war of every man against every man. Thus nothing but the satanic leviathan of unquestioned tyranny prevents the contrary worst, continual fear and danger of violent death and the life of man solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. But though Milton would repeat in Paradise Lost the passionate servitude of the fallen, true liberty is lost, which always with right reason dwells, and in Paradise regained, how to free these thus degenerate, by themselves enslaved, it did not undermine his search for the ready and easy way to establish a free commonwealth. The Messiah of Paradise Regained has dreamed of liberation to subdue proud, tyrannic power till truth were freed and equity restored. Not all the Nimrod hunt of war on each hand slaughter and gigantic deeds scattered with carcasses and arms the ensanguined field, estranged Cromwell's Latin secretary from the cause, only the manifest danger of freedom's turning on itself. O oh, citizens, if after being released from the toils of war you neglect the arts of peace, your peace will be only a more distressing war. Your very bowels will be continually teeming with an intolerable progeny of tyrants. And to Cromwell, here in Samuel Cooper's miniature, if you, who have hitherto been the tutelary genius of liberty, should hereafter invade that liberty which you have defended, a most destructive blow will be leveled against the happiness of mankind. Help us to save free conscience from the paw of hireling wolves whose gospel is their maw. 
against the temptations of his place, Cromwell tried to deserve the praise of that sonnet, our chief of men, repeatedly exhorting Parliament in Miltonic words. Is it ingenuous to ask liberty and not to give it? What greater hypocrisy than for those who were oppressed by the bishops to become oppressors themselves? So ends what Thoreau would call the last significant scrap of news from England, though much continued under the pomp of restoration. Now the blind regicide unhanged returned to his lonely epic task, as if through the parcel of trumpet display we should hear the dying falls of those da Gamba fantasies with which his composing began. and be drawn back to the tenebrous weight of Rembrandt and of Milton, like his own Noah, the only son of light in a dark age, as Wordsworth would take it up, uttering odious truth, darkness before and danger's voice behind, soul awful, if the earth has ever lodged an awful soul. But did even Milton shun one truth, that a god of the absolute, who reasons as Pope would quip, like a school divine against the quest of knowledge claimed in the Areopagitico, has no choice but to retire and put not forth his goodness, while Satan takes up the suppressed resolve not to crook the servile knee and sing forced hosannas. What though the field be lost, all is not lost, the unconquerable will. Fallen cherub, to be weak is miserable, doing or suffering. Awake, arise, or be forever fallen. The whole of Baroque exhibits willful arrogation, and Milton overweens more than the vaunters of Bernini outwardness. As heroic couplet Dryden is reported, this man cuts us all out, and the ancients too. No doubt he must pay the cost of proud command. But that he shares with Rembrandt, whom moderns more and more esteem while everybody from pound down knocks Milton, righteous pole of the western big top. It seems that against Rembrandt, Milton suffered some repressive closure, as if the soul body and moral war had made a battleground of his heart. We have said he was the first to rear a universe from the imminence of self. Was he not also the last? since no one after could conceive himself on every front of thought, poetry, politics, an instrument of God's final purpose in the world. The later God possessed, Goethe, Hölderlin, Hegel, Whitman, inherit divided realms. The owl of Minerva flies only in the deepening dusk, but to control so much and lose love's center raises the Gerontian question, after such knowledge, what forgiveness? Even the Areopagitica grounds strength on the test of no. He that can apprehend and consider vice with all her baits and seeming pleasures, and yet abstain. That denial becomes the crux of Milton's works. Perhaps only Michelangelo, in the Florentine cleavage of Medici and Savonarola, had set abandonment so voluptuously against itself. This Bacchus of his youth, fattening the soil for Comus, to roll with pleasure in a sensual sty. 
Within the navel of this hideous wood, immured in cypress shades, a sorcerer dwells, of Bacchus and of Circe born, great Comus, and here to every thirsty wanderer, by sly enticement gives his baneful cup. How can Milton build but with the passion the restrainer, as Blake says, stole from the abyss? Comus, wherefore did nature pour her bounties forth with such a full and unwithdrawing hand and set to work millions of spinning worms that in their green shops weave the smooth-haired silk to deck her sons? But all that energy, midnight shout and revelry, tipsy dance and jollity, braid your locks with rosy twine, dropping odors, dropping wine, subsists in Comus under the disapprobation and animadversion of lean and sallow abstinence. The wanted roar was up amidst the woods and filled the air with barbarous dissonance. From the Bacchic art of Titian, through the mannerist ballet of 1600, these nymphs of the chase at the transformation of Acteon, down to the fleshy rapes of Rubens, or Poussin's formality of touch, it is hard to find a foreclosure like Milton's, from the mild prudery of Lycidas, rough satyrs danced, and fawns with cloven heel, from the glad sound would not be absent long, to the paradise lost excoriations of Stuart license, and in luxurious cities where the noise of riot ascends above their loftiest towers, and injury and outrage, and when night darkens the streets, then wander forth the sons of Belial, flown with insolence and wine, witness the streets of Sodom but drive far off the barbarous dissonance of Bacchus and his revelers, the race of that wild rout that tore the Thracian bard. Against that inversion set the Elizabethan, Wilkes Madrigal, in the Oriana collection to which Milton's father had contributed. Whether this music belongs to the swirl of late Renaissance or deploys, as might almost seem, the weight of Rubens' first baroque, its force is life-affirming. <laughs> The close of Comus tries to validate a festive joy, to triumph in victorious dance, or sensual folly and intemperance. But the staid lady and youths mince it in an earth cumbered, the winged air darked with plumes. In post-Renaissance Christendom, the conscious validation of flesh may overween. Shakespeare's a green goose, a goddess. As Blanchard, with Cartesian touch, strokes Ariosto's erring Angelica. Milton inflates the sensual as man's imparadising claim. Half her swelling breast naked met his under the flowing gold of her loose tresses hid. He in delight smiled with superior love. 
nor turned, I ween, Adam from his fair spouse, nor Eve the rites mysterious of connubial love refused. Whatever hypocrites austerely talk, hail wedded love. The very angel glows rosy red when Adam asks how spirits mix by touch. Christianity had fought the brush fire of sex since before the Coptic relief of an angel contending against Leda and the Swan. But neither in the catacombs nor in the early Middle Ages, pneumatic Eve deflated to angular skin bags, nor in the dream romance of that Eve at Autun is the fall sexualized. Even the force forms of Michelangelo, Eve encrotched athwart the conspicuous male, keep body clean. It seems to go with the Protestant tending north that Marbuse's 1525 torrid eve reaches for both fruits at the same time. But this is fablo comic. Milton's reason does not smile. Against his better knowledge, not deceived, but fondly overcome with female charm. As with new wine intoxicated both they swim in mirth, And fancy that they feel divinity within them breeding wings, Wherewith to scorn the earth, but that false fruit far other operation first displayed, Carnal desire enflaming. In Rembrandt, touch raises the same danger, by a verism almost grotesque, he dodges, though the light on what Milton will call those mysterious parts, flirts the bait the poet devours. There they their fill of love and love's disport took largely, of their mutual guilt the seal, the solace of their sin, till dewy sleep oppressed them, wearied with their amorous play. As Rembrandt knew, Jove's coming to deny in a shower of gold had become a symbol of bought love, the same which Milton opposed to the hailed connubial. Not in the bought smile of harlots, loveless, joyless, unendeared, casual fruition, nor in court amours. The leaning Cupid Elliot would take up, from which a golden Cupidon peeped out weeps and wrings his hands, but the Olympian glow of the natural body makes Adams to the nuptial bower. I led her blushing like the morn, mawkishly unclean. Was Milton's luck with Eros so poor? Let this unknown English lady take us back to 1643, when the poet left his house and pupils to return with a 17-year-old wife from the royalist stronghold of Oxford. She fled to her family in a few days. Milton wrote The Doctrine and Discipline of Divorce. It may yet befall a discreet man to be mistaken in his choice. The soberest and best governed men are least practised in these affairs. Many who have spent their youth chastely, while they haste so eagerly to light the nuptial torch, may easily chance to meet, if not with a body impenetrable, yet often with a mind to all other due conversation inaccessible. Nay, instead of being one flesh, they will be rather two carcasses chained unnaturally together, or, as it may happen, a living soul bound to a dead corpse. Only when the royalist cause was ruined, and Milton was in high place, did the girl, father and all, rejoin the household. It was long after Mary Powell's death that Adam lectures hapless Eve. He never shall find out fit mate, but such as some misfortune brings him or mistake, which infinite calamity shall cause to human life and household peace confound. Or Samson, Delilah, to break all faith, all vows, deceive, betray, then as repentant to submit, beseech, if in my flower of youth and strength, when all men loved, honoured, feared me, thou alone could hate me, thy husband, slight me, sell me, and forego me, how wouldst thou use me now, blind? Milton had a second wife who died in childbirth after fifteen months. This is not a portrait of her, though of that time. Already England could foreshadow the human immediacies of Jane Austen. 
Methought I saw my late espoused saint brought to me like Alcestis from the grave. But oh, as to embrace me she inclined, I waked, she fled, and day brought back my night. Despite the second wife or the serviceable third, denial holds the settle. Not only Comus is founded on the yet abstain of the Areopagitico. In Paradise Lost, it is Satan to Eve. Die by the fruit, it gives you life to knowledge. In Paradise Regained, Satan to Christ. All men are sons of God. I also both trials requiring the prejudged negative. Not even Samson can fulfill his mission without once more fencing his ears against Delilah's sorceries. No wonder Blake had to revive that ruined man from the polyp of Uro that he might break the chain of jealousy from all its roots. The glory of the great Baroque is also its misplaced concreteness as if the radiant universe of besold transcendence could be grasped in the spatial causality and fugal syntax of assertive non-contradiction. So Bacon, Locke and Newton deify, as Blake saw it, the vegetable glass of nature. So he wrote, in Milton the father is destiny, the son a ratio of the five senses, and the Holy Ghost vacuum. But of Milton only could Blake add, in warring identification, he was a true poet, and of the devil's party without knowing it. In Paradise Lost, in Claude, in Purcell, is it bondage or transcendence when thought down tensile fields gropes the new syntax of consciousness? Sweet is the breath of morn, her rising sweet, with charm of earliest birds, pleasant the sun when first on this delightful land he spreads his orient beams on herb, tree, fruit, and flower, glistering with dew. Fragrant the fertile earth after soft showers, and sweet the coming on of grateful evening mild, then silent night with this her solemn bird, and this fair moon, and these the gems of heaven, her starry train. But neither breath of morn when she ascends with charm of earliest birds, nor rising sun on this delightful land, nor herb, fruit, flower, glistering with dew, nor fragrance after showers, nor grateful evening mild, nor silent night with this her solemn bird, nor walk by moon, nor glittering starlight, without thee is sweet. After Purcell's fantasy on one note, the polyphony of searching modulation finds a last controlled amplitude in the Ricciacari the old Bach wrote on King Frederick's tune. So the Miltonic simile reaches out and rounds on itself. His legions, thick as autumnal leaves in Valambrosa, or scattered sedge afloat when Orion hath vexed the Red Sea coast, whose waves o'er through Bucyrus and his Memphian chivalry, while they pursued the sojourners of Goshen, who beheld 
carcasses and broken chariot wheels, so thick bestrewn, abject and lost, lay these. Thus the inversion and stretch of the opening sentence of man's first disobedience, with all hanging clauses and phrases, and of, whose, into, and, with, of, till, and, sing, heavenly muse, mirrors the long inversion and quest of the poem, until the angel at the close melts history into divine plan. O oh, goodness infinite, that all this good of evil shall produce, more wonderful than that by which creation first brought forth light out of darkness. And as Christ had said in Book 3, Thou wilt not leave me in the loathsome grave. Now all the stars of morn see him rise, fresh as the dawning light. And as Lycidas, after grief and blessing, returns to today and tomorrow calm, thus sang the uncouth swain to the oaks and rills, while the still morn went out with sandals gray. At last he rose and twitched his mantle blue, tomorrow to fresh woods and pastures new. So Paradise Lost settles from the deep passions of Rembrandt into the elegiac peace of Poussin and Claude, which had always paired in Milton with tenebrist might, this late and luminous Claude, Hagar banished into silver grey. We may no longer stay. Go, wake an eve. From the other hill the cherubim descended, gliding meteorous as evening mist, risen from a river o'er the marish glide. In either hand the hastening angel caught our lingering parents, and to the eastern gate led them direct, and down the cliff as fast to the subjected plain, then disappeared, they looking back. All the eastern side beheld of paradise, so late their happy seat, waved over by that flaming brand, the gate with dreadful faces thronged and fiery arms. Some natural tears they dropped, but wiped them soon. The world was all before them.